So we're going to get started here, I believe. Um, wanted to welcome everybody to the Professional Builder Show Village here at the 2020 International Builder Show in beautiful, sunny Las Vegas. Uh, my name is Dan Morris, and I'm the editor of ProTradeCraft.com, which is a technical journal for remodelers and trade contractors, uh, mostly about uh, building stuff, nailing wood together, uh, mostly for people who wear nail bags and people who supervise people who wear nail bags uh, building houses. But today, we're not here to talk about building houses. We're going to talk about building neighborhoods with my friend Fernando Pajes Ruiz. Fernando and I have known each other for probably 15 years, going back to my old days at Fine Home Building uh, magazine, where right when I left, we were about to launch a podcast. I don't know if you remember that yeah. podcast. And... Um, we never launched that podcast because I left the magazine and went somewhere else. But we have decided to re recycle the podcast idea into a new podcast that Pro Tradecraft will be launching with Fernando as the host called per Career Toolbox. Um, but outside of Fernando's uh, podcasting career, he's also written quite a few books. Uh, we'll talk about a cu the first couple today. And really, we're here to talk about the, the third home building book. We're going to leave the yoga book out, right? No, OK. Um, so the first, the two books that he has uh, written previously is Building an Affordable House and Affordable Remodel, uh, both I think published by the Taunton Press. But here, we're here to talk about the newest book, the third book, Architectural Design for Traditional Neighborhoods. Uh, and it's available on these tables, or, and there's a couple of them up here as well. You can grab one. Uh, written with Corcut Honoran, Ronnie Pelusio, and Tom Lyon, and Fernando. Um, Kind of the cool thing about this book, Fernando, I thought, is that it's a pattern book. It's like an old-fashioned pattern book. Before we had the internet, they would make these books that had a lot of drawings in them and showed builders, you know, how to how to detail particular parts of a house um, according to time-tested standards. The other sort of thing I really like about the book is that it's only four chapters, so it's easy for to hold my attention because after four chapters, I start getting bored looking around. Um, this is a good book for the ADD personality. <laughs> so the, the, the chapters are what? Neighborhood design. Yes. Architectural styles. Yep. Architectural design. Yep. And new horizons in building materials. Yeah, that's it. That's that sounds fun. Chapter. There's a lot of pictures, too. So there's about, it's a little bit shorter than a romance novel. It's about 75,000 words. So it's easy reading. You can read it on the way home on, your, on the airplane ride. So it's kind of like romancing the, your new neighborhood. New old neighborhood. Um, so in chapter one, neighborhood design, you talk about elements from old European cities and some particularly successful American cities, such as Whitefish, Montana, and um, Savannah, Savannah, Brisbane, Arizona. What what kind of elements are you talking about, Fernando? Well, this all got started. Uh, about in the 1980s, uh, when a, a group of architects got together to design a neighborhood. It's called Seaside. It's in Florida. And this neighborhood was interesting in that it wasn't a mass uh, development like some of the other uh, tract housing developments that were going on where the, uh, where the company that was putting together development was linearly integrated, vertically integrated. They had the design, they laid out the streets, they did the platting, they built the houses, and it was pretty uniform and really designed to be a kind of massive dormitory. Well, these architects and this developer had the idea to try and recreate one of the great old neighborhoods of Florida, like where they, you know, where tourism would come, and what was it that brought people to these neighborhoods? What was it that they loved about it that they'd go on vacation to this neighborhood? And so, um, anyway, what, uh, what transpired was that they went all around the country and to Europe as well, looking at the great old neighborhoods to define what were the elements in these neighborhoods that uh, made them successful, what made people want to spend money to vacation there and just walk around. And they kind of developed a, um, <clears throat> you know, they began to measure street widths. They began to see setbacks. They began to see all the sort of the planning elements of those neighborhoods working backwards to extract a code to create a neighborhood like that. And that neighborhood resulted in this project in Florida called Seaside in a very nondescript area. They used to call it the Redneck Riviera. It was like trader parks and things like that. They began to build this neighborhood. And what they did was they created an urban planning code. The urban planning code had two aspects. One was the neighborhood design itself. 
and the other was the architectural uh, guidelines. These developers and this architect, uh, who are very successful now and quite well off, were not so at the time. And so they couldn't build out the neighborhood. So what they did is instead of building out the neighborhood, they created design guidelines for the, for the buildings that were going to go in the neighborhood and then invited architects and people from all over the country to come and participate in building it out. What happened next was the construction of this very risky real estate venture that turned out to be one of the most successful neighborhoods in the, in, in, in the country. We're still talking about Seaside. We're talking about Seaside, yeah. yes. Still one of the most successful neighborhoods in the country. And it ushered in a, uh, um, a, a, a type of development called the traditional neighborhood uh, development. And it's called the traditional neighborhood development, or TND, because it's based on the uh, principles of traditional neighborhoods. What is a traditional neighborhood? Traditional neighborhoods, neighborhoods say from before the 1940s. They were very pedestrian oriented. Uh, they were, all, you know, the, the, the streets are narrow, they're not wide, the houses are set close to the sidewalks, and all of these elements created a great deal of sociability in the sense that uh, put people in great proximity rather than separating them into individual lots on big estates, you know, where they, you, where you didn't even know who your neighbor was, you were right, right up against your neighbor, creating a neighborhood, which has created a social group out of the people that live there. And some of the elements, you can see them right here in this slide, included, for example, the, you know, the, the, the sidewalk right up next to the house, so that there was easy interaction between the pedestrian and the person up on the front porch. The narrow streets were to slow traffic. You got a narrow street, nobody wants to race down the narrow street. So there was a number of elements that are described in this book. They're simple, they're inexpensive, but they create a sense of place, a sense of an area versus just simply a, a house or a model. You know, like developers will do, you know, they'll put up a, a model house, like one of these here. And it's all alone and it's out of context but this creates a neighborhood context. It seems like it was sort of designed for people instead of designed for cars. And after the 40s, we kind of got the garageocentric architecture and the wider streets. And that, That's correct. In fact, it's, it's not anti-car, but it's designed to calm traffic, to slow cars down. So you'll see that there's parking along the sidewalks, for example, you know, parking along the street. Why? Because that, again, slows cars down. You've got to be careful. It could be a car door opening. You have street trees which also kind of defines the sidewalk area, protects the, uh, you know, the, the, the pedestrians. There's many, many elements to make it pedestrian friendly and to create kind of you know, social areas so that if you look at a traditional neighborhood, like the one that's up on the screen on, on your right hand side, you know, the, the conventional uh, developments would have houses sat on lots far away from each other, pointing in different directions, creating a great deal of privacy for the residents and creating a great deal of facility to get in and out. Traffic gets in and out easily. If you look at the, at the neighborhood on your left-hand side, you'll see that it's much tighter. It's rectilinear. It's on a street grid. Uh, there's green spaces where people can socialize the neighborhood the way we're socializing today you know, kind of in common areas, like we are. You're sitting in the living room here of this common area right now. So the parks and such serve as backyards and living, outdoor living areas for the community. Um, the houses face one another, just like we would, you know, if we were sitting at the table talking. If you and I are talking to one another, we face one another, right? Yeah, that's why we're not sitting together on the couch right. facing. Right, right, hugging. And um, so... It, it's, a, it's a way of creating neighborliness, creating social areas that are community oriented, and slowing down traffic to encourage walking. The other big element that came out of this neighborhood that's very common nowadays is what's called mixed use. Now when you go through the neighborhood and there's a bar on the corner and there's shops on the bottom and there's apartments, all of that, it's not that it originated at this development called Seaside, but it was revived. revived. Revived and mixed use just means there's a place to walk to because now you've got this great pedestrian area. But if there's no place you can walk to, if there's no coffee shop, if there's no little grocery store, if you can't walk to the church, why bother walking? <laughs> right, you don't have to drive to the strip mall for everything. There's a neighborhood store or a neighborhood restaurant, and that's correct. And so here we can see in this slide an example, kind of a social area. Those are all backs of homes. These drawings, by the way, are actually taken from neighborhoods that were developed. This one in particular, Stapleton in, in, in Colorado. 
and um, and they're and they're yeah, they're the drawings that are in in this little book, and it's illustrated and described. You know, these are the dimensions of the park. This is how it works. And the interesting thing is, people say, well, you can't have a house without a backyard that faces a park. That's crazy. But then the fact is that those homes become the most expensive in the neighborhood, and this neighborhood adds enormous value to the individual home. So the builders that develop this kind of project are then very successful financially because they're, they're you know, the land that they purchased maybe in kind of an area that wasn't, had all that much value to it. Uh, once this development is created, because of the appeal that it has, the property, value, the property values rise and rise and rise. And of course, they're much higher density, so you get a lot more dollar per square foot of land than you would in a conventional development. I was going to ask about that. It seems like you can fit more houses into the same plot, and especially if you have skinnier streets, um, so then there's more money to make yes. and more uh, accommodation for the people who live there. So it's better for everybody. This book is uh, designed for builders and it speaks the builder language. I am a builder. So for example, one thing that the new urbanists or the people that do this type of traditional neighborhood development love are alley-loaded garages where you're not, you know, you're not breaking up the sidewalk with driveways, right? That goes against the grain of the urban walking environment. Yeah. However, it's also expensive to build alleys and have rear-facing uh, uh, garages, and it's not always practical. So we go into methods of sort of creating a skinnier driveway Okay. That then widens out towards the back, and so we we break some of the some of some of the uh, you know sort of the um, orthodoxy, let's say, of this type of development to make it practical and describe how it's done. It's also a good book if you just want a primer and what is this all about. You know, in a few pages, you understand it. Yeah, get a general idea. Um, chapter two, architectural styles. That's interested me a little bit more because I'm a former carpenter, former builder. Well, there's a number of architectural styles in the United States. Most of them, most of our architectural styles came from England. You know, they were imported with the, with the ship's carpenters. And it's one of the reasons that we don't have architects designing our homes for the most part, but rather builders simply building them. Because they were the ship's carpenters and they had, just from years of experience building traditional homes in England, they had a kind of a knowledge of what the patterns are, how yep. what a front porch is supposed to look like, where how steep should a gable be, how narrow should uh, um, you know the, the the windows along a roof line be. So this translated into certain styles that were brought over into the United States, and then as they migrated south and they migrated west, those styles adapted to climate. Yeah. In some areas, they actually incorporated local indigenous styles, such like so, you know, New Mexico, you have the Pueblo architecture yeah. that influenced it. So our book goes through all the major um, you know, styles that are typical. Some of them are universal, like the craftsman style. You'll find that anywhere. Others are quite you know, specific to a, uh, a particular uh, area. Like southern styles. Like they the tend southern to styles, exactly, exactly. They tend to be taller and thinner so that they can get a lot of breeze through there. Very good. That's right. We talk about the climate reasons. Why are this? You know, why are the houses in Jordan's the way they are? Yeah. You know, why are they up high? Why do they have lots of balconies? Why do they have lots of windows causing cr cross ventilation? You know, all the kinds of climactic responses that the builders took as they brought these English styles into the south, into the west. Yeah, the, the southern climates are different than northern climates, where the houses are short, compact, and try to keep the yeah, heat trying in. to keep the heat in now. The thing you can get out of reading that chapter is not only an understanding of how to design a neighborhood within the context of your region, but also how to see your own region. Because once you read the elements of the houses in your region, you begin to notice them. You recognize Oh, yeah, patterns. they're right. Look, that's the way my house is. <laughs> yeah. And once you understand that, let's say you're doing a single house in a single development in, in, a, in an existing neighborhood, an infill, or you're doing a little pocket neighborhood. Well, you can understanding the styles in your area, you can create out of that something that fits, that's contextual. I have some slides for a longer presentation where I show these ridiculous, ha like you have these tall southern houses and then you suddenly have this little uh, uh, like craftsman bungalow in the middle. Yeah. Very cute bungalow, but looks absolutely ridiculous in context. That's what I had a question scribbled down on one of these cards is that, you know, who really cares about all of this, about how a house fits in a neighborhood? These guys are builders. They're not city planners, but you're saying 
it matters to, for them to fit into context and to sell it, the darn it, it house. matters to the consumer <laughs> you know the, if if it's a beautiful street right it's the curb appeal curb appeal is not limited to the one house imagine this beautiful house in an industrial section with junkyards on both sides that ain't curb appeal That's not good <laughs> yeah. no so it has to be within the context of the neighborhood. It has to be appropriate to the neighborhood. That house, the modern house, the one that's the, like, you know, the double wide over there with the trellis that we're looking at, where's that gonna go? You know, if we put that in, uh, here in Las Vegas in an existing neighborhood with, with uh, tile roofs and, and stucco and stuff, it's totally out of context. That one's gonna go to Palm Springs where there's a lot of homes of that style and it makes sense in that area. So you have to, you know, design your architect to the architecture to the area. Builders make the common mistake, and this is a common builder mistake, to take the same model that they always build. Well, we know the cost of this model. We know how to build it. We've got this one wired. It's got to be craftsman. Okay, we'll put some brackets on it. We'll yep. put a couple of taper crowds craftsman. So if you look at, you know, it isn't just the that ornamentation or the, de you know, the decorations on the house that make it of a certain style. It's the whole building. It's the volumes, what architects would call the massing, which is, you know, just means the roof t uh, pitches, the, you know, whether it's two story or one, whether it's yeah. one and a half story, it's the whole thing. Sounds so, yeah, so that now we're drilling in a little bit deeper from the architectural design to the actual details of massing, um, articulation. Well, Half yeah. stories, dormers. Yes, exactly. And how to make those. You can have a lot of different styles of homes along the block. You don't have to have the same house repeated all down the block, but they have to be harmonious. And yeah, you do that by having the correct massing, the correct style, compatible forms. This slide shows, you know, like a duplex on the corner, which is a great location for a duplex because instead of having a super wide front, you've got two narrow fronts that fit within the neighborhood. These homes are all sort of tall. They're like folk Victorian style, you know. And, uh, and, and so they fit together. One of the things that we do in the book is, is create a um, kind of a, um, a compatibility chart, which I'll show you here in a second, which is a very useful tool if you're doing a development. This shows what conventional builders typically do. If you look on your right hand, the right hand part of the slide, you'll see that there's like a really cool house. It's a very cool house. It's a very modern, very cool house, but it belongs by itself. Because that style of architecture draws attention to itself. It's, it stands out. It says, look who I am. This is what I like. This is what I can afford. Now, the house on the left-hand side, that house is very neighborhood friendly. It makes for a streetscape. You know, what architects call the block face, which is the cur curb appeal of the whole sidewalk versus the curb appeal of an individual unit. Notice how builders advertise their units. All of these homes here will be advertised standing by themselves. Even when you have a townhouse, they will show the townhouse in the middle of the wilderness. Yeah. Right? Like car, it's like car 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 advertisements. The yeah. guy gets in the car, he drives off into a lonely road into the desert and somehow ends up on the edge of a cliff looking over into the But that's not how you see cars. You LA see cars traffic. Yeah, you see cars in LA traffic. You see cars like so houses have that same thing. Imagine your house in traffic. <laughs> the house in the context of the oh, neighborhood. Exactly, exactly. And then suddenly, your architect, or your, as a builder, as a designer, you begin to design the block face, the whole street, versus your individual unit. And what we have is a series in this book, a series of guidelines on how to do it. Here's five different styles. This is also from a neighborhood developed, and this was part of the neighborhood guideline. We got five styles. That doesn't mean five plans, but five styles, general housing styles. You can build in this neighborhood. But these three are compatible on the same block. These four are compatible on the same. There is no place where all five are compatible along the same street front. And so we have kind of this way that you can take your own plans and begin to see how they, how they work in context. So it's got a lot of tools in this book on how to, how to of the neighborhood. Oh, am I, am I, uh, yeah, I think, see, I cannot see the slides. What do we got there? Okay, one back. That's, that's the one you should be looking at while I'm talking. <laughs> what? Two houses? What do we got? Two houses, no, next one. That one right there. Yeah, a whole bunch of pictures. That's the tool I was talking about on compatibility. Five styles, three go together, 
on no block will all five styles go together. And it describes how to create your own sort of tool where you can move things around like a, uh, a Rubik's Cube, <laughs> you know, trying to figure out what will work in context of the sidewalk that you're, you're you know, that, of, the, of the block face that you're working on. The next sections of the, uh, go ahead. Yeah, the next section, uh, the final one is about uh, new horizons. and No, architectural details. Ah. That's the third chapter. Architectural details goes into things like, am, do I have a brick mold up there now? Uh, okay, so the next section is about the blockhead stuff that builders do, don't do it. For example, brick molding belongs on brick. Brick molding doesn't belong with siding. A header should be wider than the lineals or the, you know, the, the, the vertical pieces that support it, right? Because you know that. You know that if the, if, if, the, if, the, if the tree limb is very thin, you know it's not going to support your own weight. You've got this intuition about structure. Yeah. And your house should mirror that so it looks right. Design mimics structure. Right. It, it, I, I understand that we can do anything today. We could put you know, a hairline thin header appearance-wise and then build a 10-story building on top. But unless you're purposely wanting to throw people, mess with their heads, <laughs> you know, follow the rules. Your header should be out one-sixth the width of your uh, window size, of your opening. should be out well, one-sixth the width of your opening. And that sort of looks right. Okay, definitely you don't want to picture frame it with um, brick mold. Window panes, you got a lot of these houses with square window panes on the mullions. They just kind of, that's not the way your face is. Your face is not square. Well, some, some guys' faces are a little square. But most, most people's faces are, are narrow and tall, right? You want your window to be such that you can walk up to the window pane and see outside rather than have a mullion across your eyes. So the window panes should be, you know, vertical. And you see the detailing on the window in terms of how it's trimmed out. Um, freeze. If you've ever looked at, you know, where do we get all of our molding details? We get them from the classical Greek and Roman architecture, passed down through the great stone monuments that we preserve. Those are a set of proportions. Your frieze should be wider than your fascia. You know, we do it all backwards. We put a giant fascia. T one little tiny piece of J molding is the freeze, and, and it looks odd. It, it's like bad grammar, you know? And it's really easy to find these. I mean, these are rules of thumb for design that have been <laughs> existing for thousands of years. Yes, for thousands of years. <laughs> Not new. <laughs> so, and, and these are just some examples of things well done and done with inexpensive materials. You see some pretty big items. And when you walk through the show floor, you'll see giant... Uh, uh, you know, uh, cellular PVC uh, components, parts. So you can do this today. Yes, you are faking it. None of those are real structural elements, but every we paint houses with brick. I mean, the structure is like gone. You know, the structure is the OSB. <laughs> yeah. So, so these are elements you can, if you know what you're doing, you can design the house so it looks like it could hold its own weight. Yeah. And like things, things like... Um even uh, like the, the the rake moldings that go up, the dental moldings yes. are supposed to. The, the the whole point of them is to mimic the structural parts that went up the purlins from the you know yeah. thousands of years ago. That's right. What well, held up the roof? <laughs> yeah, yeah. The uh, the number of materials builders love to like throw all kinds of material on a structure. Like if it was you know pot puree, uh, uh, the the uh, buffet line approach to uh, <laughs> to architectural uh, ornamentation. If some is good, then more is better. Right. Let's put brick on it. Let's put let's put stone on it. Let's put siding on it. Let's put you know and the house sort of looks ridiculous in the end. It looks like a showroom. Like you know the lumberyard could be dressed up like that so you could see all the different things they sell. But in reality, you know the, so and and, and and, you know, planners do this, too. You go to the neighbor's heads, we want 30% uh, masonry on the front of every house. So you get these ridiculous things where the, where the guy measures out and say, okay, 30% will we'll put up so high along the front of the house, it'll be river rock. And then, you know, you get, you get the um, uh, situation like the house that's on your right-hand side. That river rock, it comes up to here on the house. It's like a pair of waders, right? Right underneath the window. It looks like they're going fishing in this house. That's not doesn't look like a foundation. And they've got seven gables on it. It's so busy, it's dizzy. It, it's a ridiculous house. It's mimicking the folk Victorian style, which is the house on the left. And that's a real one. And that's got one material on it. 
It's got one cladding. Along the base, along the foundation, yes, there's a heavy masonry material, which is where it belongs. Maybe up a chimney. That's it. The rest, in this case, it's vinyl siding. But the traditional finish of this style of housing is clapboard. It doesn't have river rock going up to its chest. Yeah. And the, I mean, the traditional ones look great because they were built probably using pattern books like this. That I love. Um, I love the different options in the book for different porches and um, overhangs. There's just like a lot of ways that you can build the same sort of thing within the same style, but they don't have to all be identical. In fact, they shouldn't be. In fact, was, they shouldn't be. I was recently in Florence, Italy, gorgeous city. I didn't see two buildings alike, yet there's a, such harmony there that you fall in love. You actually fall in love with the place. So harmony is like, in the slide you're looking at now, on the right-hand side, you've got the real windows. You, this is in uh, uh, St. Augustine, Florida. This is the window style, right? This is the trim style. On the, um, on the left-hand side, you have a, a new version of it. You know, this is made with vinyl. This is, this is not a re museum reproduction, but you see it does, it, it does show gratitude, if you will, to, to, the, to the historical architecture of the place, and it's beautiful. So you can do beautiful work, and they didn't, you know, they're, they're basically expressing one thing, clapboard and these cool windows. <laughs> you know, that's it. That's yeah. what the house says. Um, you want to talk about new materials? Uh, we can. Uh, uh, the, um, you want to keep talking about architectural details? Yeah, we can, we can, we can mo move on, I guess. It's time. <laughs> so the, the last chapter of the book, uh, the fourth chapter, is, uh, is, is called New Horizons in Building Materials, something like that, right? A title I love. Yeah. And, and basically what it says is, look, all this stuff is, was originally done with wood, with very good wood that's not easily available today, very expensive labor that knew how to do this stuff, right? But you can do it today using essentially what are, um, if you will, you can create kind of a Hollywood set. You know, the, you're uh -huh. using materials that are durable, that are lightweight, that are, it, relatively speaking, very inexpensive and can do a very good job of reproducing these styles. Yeah, just because you have new materials doesn't mean you can't build old details. Well, in fact, you want to build the old details out of new materials because the old details take an ungodly amount of maintenance. Yeah. You know, you're scraping paint every single year. I know about that. Yes, we all began, our, if you're old enough, you began your career scraping paint. That was your first job. In Seaside, that original slide I showed of that first subdivision that kind of took self-consciously this approach, the first code required only natural materials. You could only use wood, and you couldn't, you couldn't use any kind of an artificial material, not fiber cement, not vinyl siding, not uh, wood-fibered products, nothing. In, in 1997, I think it was, they had to change the code and just essentially say, do a good job if you're going to use an artificial material with it. Yeah. Well, that's know? great. Make it look good and you're in. Yeah. Our friend and one of the great critics of our industry is uh, Steve Muzan, and he likes to say, if you're going to fake it, fake it well. That's his favorite saying. If you know Steve, you're sick of hearing that yeah. stupid phrase. But, it's, but he makes the point. That, and so the code's been updated, even at this uh, iconic development seaside, to allow plastics and other types of materials to come in. And, you know... There's a beautiful example of batten and board siding right on that modern house. I can take see a close, it. Take a close look at that. Touch it. It, tap, it, 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 it passes the, the tactile test. You can touch it. It feels real. You can tap on it. It sounds real. You know, it's a really good job of reproducing a traditional style. But that house won't fade. It's not going to rot. Five years from now, we won't be scraping it. Okay, well, the book is Architectural Design for Traditional Neighborhoods, written by Fernando Pajes Ruiz with a few other folks. Um, and I think there's a, still a couple of copies up here, and there might be one or two copies on the tables out there. Uh, grab one before somebody else does. Thank you. Thank you.